Recently, I've been sharing uh, something I believe God put on my heart while I was in the course of recovering after surgery here a few weeks ago, and I've entitled what I've been sharing with you, Thanks a Million. You can see it if we have a slide there. There it is, Thanks a Million. In behind the bolder Thanks a Million is the word thanks that's written over and over and over again. We've been looking at how incredibly important it is to have a thankful heart, not just at Thanksgiving time. You know, you could, it, you could, it, would, it would not be unusual to hear a sermon about how important a thanks, thankfulness is, but it's usually right around Thanksgiving time. And what my premise is to you is that we should be thankful and live being and living thankful lives regardless of what time of the year it is. Thanks a million. There is this direct nexus between us being thankful and the level of joy that we have in life. There have been literally you can go and find this yourself, but there have been thousands of studies done on this out there, not necessarily in the church, but out there that has proven what the church preaches is true. That having a thankful heart leads to greater joy in people's lives. I sense that the Lord was putting specifically a passage on my heart that's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 17, the very first week We talked about these. I helped you put it to memory. Anybody stick with it? No. Okay. I know better. I know better. So here's how the verse goes. We've got it for you on the screen here. Always rejoice. Pray at all times. Give thanks no matter what happens. This is the way God wants you who belong to Jesus Christ to live. I made it even easier for us to put to memory uh, by saying it this way. Always rejoice, always pray, always be thankful, for this is the way God wants Christians to live. Always rejoice, always pray, always be thankful, for this is the way God wants us to live. To live. Sometimes I think when we look at the Bible, we look at verses and we just, you know, take them at face value. But I always think it's helpful to be reminded that by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, a person put these words on paper. We believe that, right? That a person inspired by the Holy Spirit put these words on paper. And so Paul, when he was originally writing such things, was sensing that God was saying something to him to convey to the church, to the believers in the church at Thessalonica, right? Like if you sit down to write a letter to somebody, You've got things in your brain, in your mind, in your heart that you want to convey to them. Or in modern day, if you want to text something to somebody or email something to somebody, there are certain things. Just the other day, John uh, Camiolo sent me an email. It was a lengthy email, and he was just sharing his heart with me, right? So as he's sitting down to write that, there are certain things in his mind, in his brain, that he was endeavoring to convey. In a very much similar sense, as Paul's sitting down to write this letter to the Christians that lived in that area, there are certain things on his mind, on his heart, that he's trying to convey to them. One such thing that he wants to tell them is always rejoice, Pray, always pray, and always be thankful, for this is God's will for your life, right? So he writes that. The very next sentence, he says, 
and do not quench the Holy Spirit. What I hear in that is, if you want to quench the Holy Spirit, is don't rejoice, don't pray, and don't be thankful. He's he's concerned that they might behave or do something in a certain way to extinguish what God would want to do in their midst. And that's what I felt that as God was putting this word on me personally in the moment that I was in of, you know, when, you're, when something happens to you in life that is unexpected, unwanted, right? You know, when the doctor says to you, you need to have, we need to open up your chest and work on your heart. That is an unwanted moment. Nobody, I looked at my wife, I'm like, what, what are we doing here, Right? I never in my wildest dreams thought I would ever get here. And Paul's saying, in those moments, always rejoice, always pray, and always give thanks. For that's how he wants you to live. I spent most of my time, as I've shared with you about this, talking to you about the impact between the two phrases being thankful, and being joyful. We've talked about the nexus, the connection between those two things. And I've said to you repeatedly, it starts with giving thanks, then you become joyful. It's not the other way around. We don't wait till we're joyful to give thanks. We start by giving thanks, and God releases joy in our life. That's what we looked at. The verse, one verse we looked at last week came from Nehemiah chapter 12, where Nehemiah had, had gotten people to, bless you, Justin. I hope you feel better. <clears throat> to always, he, he, he got some people together to have a choir at one end of the city and another choir at the other end of the city, and their sole responsibility was just to give thanks to God. Then it says, there was much rejoicing among them because God had given them great joy. He released a spirit of joy upon them because they had been obedient to arrange the choirs to give thanks. It's thanks, then joy, not joy, then thanks. But today I want to talk to you about that that middle phrase. I I haven't touched on it hardly at all in this trilogy of always rejoice, always pray, and always give thanks. I want to talk to you today for a few moments about always pray. It's interesting how different translations render this. The NIV says it this way, pray continually. The English Standard Version says, pray without ceasing. The Christian Standard Bible says, pray constantly. God's Word today renders it, never stop praying. When I read this, You could easily come away thinking that all you should ever do is be in your prayer closet praying. Or you might think, somehow I've got to go about my everyday life and in the midst of that, be praying nonstop. Well, we'll see. (laughs) The word in the Greek that's translated continuously Uh, constantly, without ceasing, is only used three times in the Bible. In the whole entire, the the Greek word is only used three times in the Bible, and it's only used by Paul, and it's only used in in this book of Thessalonians, three times. I want to look at the context of what that means in the other two places besides the one we're looking at. If you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, 1, verse 3, this is how Paul renders that same word. He says, we continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by, the hope in the Lord, by your hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Again, at the beginning of that, it says, we continually remember before God. In chapter 2, verse 13, he uses it in this way. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from it, from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as, as it actually is the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. Again, the phrase, we th also thank God continually for you, I'll, I'll say it that way, because of their reception of the word of God. And then finally, the third time it's used is used in chapter 5, verse 17, which is rendered pray continuously or unceasingly. Now, when you look, when you, when you kind of pull back this, the, the, the pages a little bit, you find out that the first two times that Paul uses this word helps inform us about his comment about prayer. Now, this much we know. We know that the church at Thessalonica was not the only church on Paul's mind. Can we all agree about that? He had several other things that God had had him engaged in, involved in. We know there's a letter to the Corinthians that he was helped found that church uh, in Philippi, in Ephesus, in Colossians. So there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff that Paul's engaged in, okay? <clears throat> with caring with these, uh, the various things, he actually at one point, one passage says, I carry the burden of the church with me every day, right? He's, he, he's got a lot of stuff going on. It wasn't possible. It's not humanly possible to be continuously thinking about the church in Thessalonica when you got to be also thinking about the church in Corinth. Do you follow what I'm trying to say? So even though he's conveying to them that he, uh, you could ha hear him saying, I'm thinking about you in a nonstop way. I, there's a little bit different thing going on here. <clears throat> the word continually here can mean without interruption. In other words, it, it's happening all day, every day kind of thing, right? Or it can mean frequently or regularly. This word continue non-ceasing. It can mean either thing. I believe Paul is saying to the church at Thessalonica, I want to make sure that you are praying regularly. Often. I think that, and I have a reason for believing that. Now, that's what I want to share with you. Every devout Jewish person, which Paul was, in fact, in Philippians chapter 3, he said he was making an argument in, in that chapter that he was more devout than any other Jewish person that ever lived. You can go there and read it yourself. So any devout Jewish person was devoted to praying two forms, not two times, two forms of prayer every day. All right? The first one, I have it for you here on the screen, the first one was called Shema. It's a type of prayer. And in particular, their day would start out, a devoted Jewish person's day would start out with this prayer. Hear, O Israel, it comes out from Deuteronomy, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So first thing in the morning, a devout Jewish person would pray what they called the Shema. They would quote this passage from Deuteronomy, I believe it's chapter 3. They would quote this section of Old Testament scripture every day, first thing in the day. The second form of prayer that they found themselves engaged in was, is, is spelled A-M-I-D-A-H, or it's pronounced Amida. Amida, there it is. But what was, it was more commonly known as the 18. The 18. The 18 involves another Benny word. If you were here last week or you happened to listen online to what I shared, 
We talked about thanks in terms of the benefits of God. We talked about thanks in terms of him being our benefactor. We talked about uh, thanks in terms of us being the beneficiary of what he does for us. This is the 18 or the um, uh, um, Amida, the Amida has to do with another Benny word. It's the word benediction. Now let's break that word down for just a second. If you break that word down, we know Benny means good. B-E-N-E means good. We know diction is about words or speech. So if you put the two together, the word benediction means good speech or good words. For a Jewish person, the 18 or the benedictory type prayers would always begin with these words, blessed are you God. I want you to say that with me on three here this morning. One, I forgot to count. One, two, three. Blessed are you, God. Bless. The word bless. Blessed are you, God. To bless means to speak the good of someone or something else. To speak the good of someone or someone some, something else. <clears throat> In the morning, when they woke up, after they prayed their first form of prayer, the Shema, where they were declaring who God was, they then would, in the morning, pray the 18 at the start of their day. They would start out uh, with this phrase, blessed are you, God. Blessed are you, God, in the morning, but then in the middle of the day, they would pray the 18 again. Blessed are you, God. And I'll get to the rest of it in just a second. But it would start out, blessed are you, God. And then at the very end of the day, they would pray the 18 again. Blessed are you, God. Now, every rabbi with his disciples, I don't know if everybody understands how this works, but a devout Jewish person who was looking to be uh, uh, tutored and nurtured in what it meant to live uh, uh, a fully devoted Jewish life, they would find a rabbi to teach them. So there were multiple rabbis out there, and every rabbi would have his or uh, have their disciples, right? They would have disciples, just like many people view Jesus as a rabbi, and he had his disciples. The, 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 the men who were interested in learning up close and personal what it meant to follow God. So these rabbis, uh, now back to the 18, or this form of prayer, Amida, back to that, every rabbi would teach their disciples how to pray the 18. They would pray 18, blessed are you, God, and then he would teach them what to say after that. 18 different, for 18 different things in life. Are you following me? I don't want to lose you. Oh, for example, let me just example it for you. Well, a rabbi might teach his followers to say, blessed are you, God or Lord, who heals the sick. Who heals the sick. They, he, the, a rabbi would teach his disciples, listen, God is ultimately the one over the health of our bodies. Thank God for doctors. Thank God for nurses. Thank God for all that. But ultimately, God is the one who heals people. So, as a disciple of a rabbi, the rabbi would say, uh, we're going to enhance, blessed are you, O God, and you're going to add to that, for, for you heal the sick. Health and well-being come from you, O God, blessed are you. 
And then, so what would happen was he would teach them 18, essentially 18 things to give God thanks for. And in the morning, they would pray these things, the whole 18. In the middle of the day, they would stop once again and pray the 18. And then at the end of the day, before the, before the lights went out, meaning they closed their eyes and went to sleep, they would pray the 18 once again. Blessed are you, God, and then fill in the blank. They were training their disciples for gratitude. The good life they believed involved gratitude. So, so these, these moments of prayer were moments to exercise thanksgiving, moment to exercise gratitude. Gratitude doesn't come when we get more stuff. That's the insane folly of our day. Our culture lives for more stuff. And we have less thankful people now than we've ever had. And we have more stuff than we've ever had. Gratitude comes when you begin to see reality. The reality of life. You know, when you are met with a moment that you don't know how it's going to come out, when it comes out in a good way, you've just, you've just landed on reality. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you. You are the Lord who heals. When do you find that out? You find that out when you are at a moment when it could go either way. And when it goes in a way you had hoped, thank you, Lord. You get what I'm trying to say? That's when it comes home. All of a sudden, when you're in that moment, you don't care whether you got a house, a four-wheeler. You don't care whether you can hunt or fish. All of a sudden, that stuff all goes out the window. Right now, right now it's about how's this thing going to end up? And when it ends up in a favorable way, you go like, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. The really important benefits in life come from our wonderful benefactor of which you are and I am grace-given beneficiaries of. That's as simple as that. On the Sabbath, they would pray the 18 an extra time because they didn't have to work. They took time to thank God for not having to work. I praise the Lord. That's right. Okay. Now, now beyond discussing the rabbi and his disciples, beyond discussing the best uh, wording for their 18, they would also talk to their disciples about how to go about doing this. For example, the rabbis, some of the rabbis would tell their disciples, never say the 18 when you're on a donkey. That's interesting. Okay? Don't be on, don't be in the car riding along trying to say the 18. Because, here was their thinking, because if you are riding on a donkey, you're up higher than you should be, and when you're giving thanks to God, you need to humble yourself. Don't pray him while you're riding on a donkey. Get off the donkey and get before God and pray the 18, right? They would regularly pray the 18 when they went up to the temple. You can read this in the New Testament in between the lines. And for example, Acts chapter 3 says, one day Peter and John were going to the temple at the time of prayer in 3 in the afternoon. They were going up to the temple to pray the 18. That's what they were doing. They were going up there to give thanks to God in the way that 
that they had been taught. Interestingly enough, uh, they would go to the temple because it was a reminder to them that the very presence of God dwelt in that place. There were people, obviously, who wanted to pause and pray the 18, but couldn't get to the temple, so the the rabbis would teach them and train them how to figure out, for those who were directionally disoriented, how to figure out what direction the temple was at, And, and when they stopped to pray the 18, they were to turn their face toward the temple. They discussed all this stuff. It was actually called by a name, uh, Talmidim. Talmidim was the name of this instruction, specific instruction that a rabbi would give to their disciples. In fact, many believe that when the disciples of Jesus came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, they were asking him, like all the other rabbis and disciples, how to pray the 18. How do we pray the Uh, Amida, how do we do this? How do you want us to do this? And of course, we know what Jesus taught them. He taught them what we now know as the Lord's Prayer. Many people who study early Christianity believe that the early Christians prayed the Lord's Prayer three times a day. It was their uh, Amadi. It was their... their, They believed that as disciples of Jesus Christ, him being their rabbi, this was the prayer he taught us to pray. Beyond praying the Shema and the 18, they would have other, uh, I don't want to say forms, but other moments of prayer. I want to talk to you about one of them. Every meal was an occasion to pray, specifically to express gratitude in that moment. Food was not eaten until people stopped and remembered that it was a gift. How things have changed. I read this this week. Food that was not blessed, food that there was no gratitude uh, 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 given for it, where people just came and ate and kind of inhaled the food, um, they actually, if they forgot, I, I think there's times, anybody ever have that happen where you just start eating and forgot? Well, we forgot to pray, right? if they forgot to pray, and they didn't remember that they forgot to pray until they had left the place that they were praying, a lot of rabbis taught their disciples, you have to literally go back to the place where you ate and give thanks for it. Or you will, they saw it as stealing. If you did not give thanks for the food that God has gifted you with, It's like you're stealing it from God. Wow. Wow. A rabbi taught a man must not taste anything until he has first blessed it or given thanks for it. You're not so much blessing the food. You're blessing God for providing you with the food. It was an opportunity to bless God. They were serious about gratitude, dead serious. I want to ask you this question. Has anybody ever ate at Chick-fil-A before? All right. All right. If you haven't, it's at least worth trying it once for sure. For me, it's the sauce. It's the sauce. You can have the rest of it. I just like the sauce. I just go in and ask the people, give me some of those little things of sauce. I don't care about it. Just eat the sauce. I don't care about sauce. So here's the, I'm trying to paint a picture for you. So if you were at Chick-fil-A and you just started to wolf down your food, right? And then you would say you were traveling someplace as, as we have before. You're traveling someplace. You get going down the road and you remember, whoops, I forgot to say thank you for that. 
what they taught was you had to turn around, turn, turn your car around, drive back to the Chick-fil-A. If somebody's in your seat that you were sitting in when you ate, you tell them to get out of the seat because you got to sit down there and thank God for it. Now, the reason they did that is to help you to remember not to forget. Don't forget. That's how serious they were about it. Not only did they thank God for the food in general, but they thank God for each, each portion of the food. For instance, when the bread came out, Lord, thank you for this bread. Thank you for providing this gift for us. Then when the figs came out, they blessed the figs. They thanked God for the figs. Then when the wine came out, they thanked God for the wine. And, when, and if they were fortunate enough to have meat, when the meat came out, they gave thanks again for the meat. Remember the Last Supper? Remember? We get a little window. When it came time for the bread, it says Jesus gave thanks for the bread. When it came time for the cup, he stopped and he again gave thanks for the cup. They were, they were serious about giving thanks. They were serious about cultivating gratitude in their hearts. The general principle that they lived by was to bless God for every gift. Every gift. Rabbi said, he who enjoys anything from creation which was, is without blessing commits misuse. In our day, if we pray over a meal at all, we do it really quick. Kind of like the perfunctory at the beginning of the thing, but not Jesus. He did what any devout Israelite would do. Every time an item of food came along, he'd say, bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord, for this gift. I can't even believe we get to have this. Thank you. They had a blessing for everything. They had a blessing for a lamp. They had a blessing for seeing a planet in the sky. They had a blessing for seeing the ocean. They had a blessing for visiting special places, blessings for rain, blessings for a home. No occasion was too menial. We're told that the disciples would follow their rabbis around because they never knew when he might say another blessing, and they wanted to know how do we do that. There are even stories told of, a, of disciples following a rabbi around when he went into the bushes to go to the bathroom. Yeah. They wanted to know, is there going to be a blessing? A particular rabbi, I can't pronounce his last name, uh, is spelled A-B-A-Y-E-I, Ab. By a, something like that. He had a blessing, a bathroom blessing. Blessed are you, Lord, who has formed man in wisdom and created in him many orifices and many cavities. Now, that may sound strange or even coarse to us right now, but how, now, how many of you ever discovered that if those orifices aren't working well... You got a problem. You got a problem. And if they are working well, thank you, Lord. Right? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, who has made orifices, right? Hallelujah for orifices. Rabbis would teach them to, to teach them this. Shame on you for thinking. Uh, you are so proper that any part of your existence is too undignified to thank God who thought it up. Shame on you for thinking there is something unspiritual, something not worthy of thanking God for. They had blessings for people, all people. Rabbis would teach their students that life with God has a lot to do with people. Yes? No? For sure. 
We should thank God. We should bless God. We should bless people, both the ones we get along with and the ones we don't get along with. Hello? That's a hard part. This life with God and learning to be thankful will help me to learn to be grateful for imperfect people and imperfect situations. That's what we're learning. That is the great experiment that you and I are engaged in. Our job is not to try to summon gratefulness like, oh, I got to do, I got to be better at being thankful. Rather, rather, gratitude is the byproduct of being spiritually real. As we train ourselves to live in reality, that means understanding who God is, understanding where he has placed us, understanding that he has placed us within the the sphere or realm, meaning all the people around us are part of his divine plan in our lives. Thanking God for that. We train ourselves to live in this reality. Our job is to place our minds on God. To cultivate his presence in our life, to surrender our will. And when we do such things, we start to come to believe that he is is here in the midst of my life. I'm not carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders. He's carrying the the world on his shoulders. And, And my heart says, thank you, God. Thank you, God, that I get to be alive. Thank you that we that I have a body. Thank you that you've given me this world to live in. Thank you for Jesus. If I wait for perfect people and perfect circumstances to be grateful, I will be waiting a long, long time. Rabbis would teach their disciples, one is obligated to say a benediction over evil as well as a benediction over good. Why? Because evil's a good thing? Uh, Absolutely not. Suffering, a good thing? Absolutely not. Of course those are bad things. But it is God who is at work to one day completely overcome and overturn the suffering and negative things. I want you to notice, if I take you back to those verses I felt God put on my heart, I want you to notice, and you can go back and look at the little, little literal rendering of this passage, it says there to be thankful in all circumstances, not to be thankful for all circumstances. The reason that, that rabbis would teach their disciples to, be, to bless and to be thankful uh, for the negative stuff as well is because we, become, uh, it, we fall into danger when we're only thanking God for the good things. And when we do that, our threshold for gratitude ends up getting higher and higher and higher and we become ungrateful people. Being transformed by God means learning to see the ways in which God is at work, even in negative situations. Paul said it best when he wrote as a as a both a student and could have been a rabbi, if I, for I know all things work together for the good. All things. The grateful life in God is the greatest opportunity he has ever afforded us as a human race. As I said a moment ago, that is the experiment that you and I are running in right now. God is saying, how much will this man or this woman give me thanks, whether they are in plenty or in want? If we don't answer that question well, we have in large part missed the whole reason for our lives. In conclusion this morning, I want to say to you, it's right for us to be glad for our friends. 
It's right for us to be thankful for our houses, our cars, for money, for success when it comes our way, for our jobs if we have them, for our health and our well-being. But their absence does not prevent us from being grateful to God for his greatest gift. So above all, as followers of Jesus, whether we are in plenty or in need, whether we live in palaces or we find ourselves in a prison, we need to thank God for his greatest gift, which is his son, Jesus Christ. His matchless life, his unrivaled teachings, his sacrificial death, his triumphant resurrection, all of those things are things we should be saying repeatedly throughout the day, every day, blessed are you, O God. Blessed are you, O God. Thank you, God, for your gifts to me. Paul said it best. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, whatever you do, whatever you do, wherever you're at, whether it's happening good or happening bad, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through the fa- to the Father through him. I leave you with this. Jesus told a story about 10 lepers. True, true story. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a parable. True story. As he's coming into a particular area, there were 10 lepers. Now, uh, I, I don't want to go on and on about this, but leprosy was seen in their day and in their time as, as something really bad. Really, it was an incurable, they thought incurable disease. And it was, uh, I don't want to go into the, all the details of it, but it was the bad thing. And, and because of their leprosy, they were ostracized from their family, their community and whatnot. And a lot of times what would happen is the only people they could hang out with were other lepers, yeah. right? So there's 10 of them hanging out in the, in the countryside there, uh, trying to find some solace with one another. And as Jesus comes along, apparently they'd heard about him, heard about his, uh, his, uh, his ability to do miracles, so and so on. They're crying out to him for help. They're, they're asking, would you help us? Would you please help us? And on this particular occasion, he had healed some other, uh, lep- uh, someone with leprosy earlier, but on this occasion... He tells them, he says, listen, go just, he didn't say anything, well, you're healed in my name or anything like that. He just said, go show yourself to the priest. Well, if you know the, if you know the, uh, the priests were more than just pastors, they were more than just, uh, people putting out, you know, religious things. They were kind of the, uh, uh, I don't know, what, what do I want to call them? They were kind of like in a, in a societal way, they were like, uh, the thing, uh, people went through them about stuff, right? So if somebody had been declared unable to mingle with society and had been ostracized in that way, the only way they could find themselves being grafted back into society was to go get a, get a clean bill of health from the priest. So Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. So well, they they, they leave, and it tells us in that story, it says, as they were going, as they were on their way, which you got to give them credit for taking Jesus up on his words of instruction, you got to give them credit for obeying. Okay, well, all right, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not healed yet, but if you want to go, we're supposed to go to the priest, go. So they start going to the priest, and the way it's worded in there, as they were going, they got healed. They got healed. And, uh, you know, I I wonder what that moment would have been like uh, for them, you know, as they were going along there. And, you know, how did they they come into that? You know, I can only imagine them looking at one another and saying, like, dude, you you got all your parts back, you know? Yeah, you know, it had to have been amazing, you know? 
And it tells us, and I think it's the whole point of the story, it tells us that only one of them, the ten, only one, what did he do? He returned to this place where those words were spoken and he gave thanks. One. One. Jesus says in that moment, here is this one who has returned to give thanks. Where are the other ones? Where are they at? And then he says these words. This is really something. He says, and this one that came back is a Samaritan. Ouch. In our day and in our age, we'd say it this way. The one that came back even isn't a devoted church-going person. It was kind of an indictment on his culture, the Jewish culture in that moment. While there may have been some who were devoted to give thanks, there were plenty others who weren't thanking God at all. Ouch. I, I said to you last week, I want to consider myself part of the choir. That, that choir it was assigned to give thanks. I, I, want, I want to be in that number. Because you won't miss out on the joy. The joy is still coming your way too. But I want to be one of those people that ushers in, that sustains what God wants to do, not cancels it out because I failed to give thanks. I hope you're of the same. I want to be that Samaritan that is constantly returning and saying, bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Interesting, if you go back there and study the rest of that little, that little uh, scene there, uh, you know, it, Jesus acknowledged that all of them had, uh, had, that all 10 had received a physical healing. But he said, only this one is well, body, soul, and spirit. This one got it all. He got the whole enchilada. I want the whole enchilada. I, I want to be giving thanks nonstop. I want to be doing it, praying it, rejoicing in the prayer closet, out of the prayer closet, I don't, wherever, Lord, pausing. I want to challenge you. I want to encourage you. Can you, can you find it in your heart? To give thanks to God morning, noon, and night. And maybe not just at your food moment. You know, maybe say, well, that give me a good reason to eat. So I, I, I can give God thanks. I, I hope you do. I hope, I hope when you go to eat, you do give God thanks. Not not not. Blessing, like, you know, when my kids were at home and they were younger, we'd go around the table and somebody different would pray when we ate, right? And, and a typical prayer at our house, Lord, thank you for this food. Please help it to be good. <laughs> In Jesus' name, amen. That's it. Help it to be good. It's true. It's so true. Help it to be good. It's not, it, we're pausing to say, Lord, I can't believe that you have blessed me so much that I get to eat again. Right? 
But if you're taking everything for granted, that heart's not in you. You think you provided the food. Hello? Thank you, Lord. Will you stand with me? Thank you that we can stand, Lord. Lord, I ask that you would, last week I prayed that you would sign us up for that choir. This week, I pray that you will, that, that 10% of us won't be good enough, Lord. That all of us as figurative leopards would return to give you thanks. And in so doing, it goes, keeps coming back to that place of the way into your presence, the way into your heart, the way into you having an exchange with us is through us giving thanks. And I'm asking, Lord, morning, noon, and night that you would put it on our hearts to stop whatever is so important to us to say, bless you, O Lord. I pray that as we, we count our blessings, Lord, we can come up with way more than 18. Way more than 18. Way, way more than 18. That we would pause and bless you that our benedictions, Lord, our good speech, our good words would be many. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. We started out our service today thanking you. We're ending our service saying thank you, Lord. And before this, day's, this day ends, I know for one, I will thank you again. I will thank you for, for all the many blessings, but I particularly, Lord, thank you for what you have done in my life through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Impregnate us with this, Lord. Lord, we're so busy trying to make sure we don't get ritual about anything that we don't do anything regularly. We're so busy worrying about becoming something that we don't, that loses its value, that we don't do the things that are most valuable. <laughs> Lord, put it on our hearts to stand before you and regularly pray always, regularly give you thanks. Lord, when we rush right in, we come right, we try to rush right in your presence and ask for a bunch of stuff, cut us, pull us up short. Hey, hold on, hold on. Why don't, why don't you say thank you? Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We all know, real quick, I know you had bless, blessings to all of you. But anyways, we all know what it's like as parents. When something nice has happened to one of your children, and we say these words, what do you say? Right? Have you ever met a child that refuses to say those words? Does it have to be your child? I don't know. It's an awkward moment, is it not? I, I want to stay away from awkward moments. And when, it, when it, is, it is time for us to give thanks to God, God's not there, having us be there right next to us. What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? We're like, thank you. Thank you, Lord. All right. God bless you. You guys are awesome. Have a wonderful day.